Hello, um, good afternoon and welcome to our series of Zoom events at LMU. Uh, my name is Christina Bogdanov. I'm the director of the Caloria Center for Modern Greek Studies. And today's presentation commemorates the 200 years anniversary of the Greek War of Independence and 200 years of Greece as a modern nation. The Caloria Center is honored to, to welcome Professor Roderick Beaton, a renowned scholar of Hellenic Studies and a member of the committee Greece 2021, which has been charged by the Greek government with overseeing events commemorating this important anniversary. We're equally honored today to have with us uh, Her Excellency, the Ambassador of the Hellenic Republic to the US, Alexandra Papadopoulou, and the Consul General of Los Angeles, Evgenia Beniatoglou. Thank you both for being with us today. Um, the Ambassador will introduce her speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon and good evening to those outside the Western Hemisphere. Uh, warmest congratulations to the Caligera Center for Modern Greek Studies and uh, the director, Dr. Christina Bogdanu, for an exceptional work you've been doing in the West Coast regarding Greek culture and Greek uh, education. And of course, for your great contribution in the extensive celebration of the 200th bicentennial, mm -hmm. the bicentennial of the Greek Revolution of uh, 1821. Of course, this year, due to the pandemic, uh, we couldn't have the celebration we originally planned, uh, but then, nevertheless, we can use uh, technology and uh, we can have and listen to speakers like Dr. Beaton, uh, whom otherwise would have been very difficult uh, to have in person in the United States in the West Coast. Uh, the celebration of the 200th anniversary of the Greek Revolution uh, uh, is a cause to honor, is a good opportunity to honor all those who sacrificed their lives uh, and their property and their money, and they put everything in the cause uh, of the war, uh, of the Greek War of Independence, uh, which are the Greeks both inside and outside Greece. It's also a way to honor all of those Philelines uh, who contributed enormously uh, to the cause of Greek independence. Uh, express our gratitude to them. And of course, above everything else, this is a golden opportunity to reflect on the revolution, on the war of independence, and reflect also on the 200 years of modern Greek state. And who better to help us reflect on that than Dr. Beaton, who is one of the most well, most well known scholars of Greek modern state. I have read your book, as I told you before, and I was impressed. And uh, although born, raised Greek, uh, 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 this helped me so much understand my own people. Professor Beaton grew up in Edinburgh and studied English literature at Peterhouse, Cambridge, before turning to modern Greek as the subject of his doctorate, also at Cambridge and at the British School in Athens. After a three-year postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Birmingham, he embarked on a long career at King's College London, first as a lecturer in modern Greek language and literature, and then later as a Korais professor of modern Greek and Byzantine history, language and literature, and since 2018 as an emeritus professor. From 2012 to 2018, he also served as director of the Center for Hellenic Studies at King's College. Professor Beaton is the author of many books and articles about aspects of the Greek-speaking world from the 12th century to the present day, including an introduction to modern Greek literature, 1994, George Seferi's Waiting for the Angel, a biography, 2003, Byron's War, a Romantic Rebellion in Greek Revolution, 2013, all three of which won the prestigious Rassiman Award for best book on the Hellenic world. And Greece, Biography of a Modern Nation, 2019, now it's a penguin paperback, which is the book I spoke about before. His latest book, An Overview of Greek History from the Bronze Age to 2021, is due to be published in autumn 2021 with the title, The Greeks, A Global History. He's a fellow of the British Academy, a fellow of King's College, commander of the Order of Honor of the Hellenic Republic, and a member of the Committee Greece 2021, which has been charged by the Greek government with overseeing events commemorating the 200th anniversary of the start of the Greek Revolution. 
From September to December 2021, he has been appointed Leventis Visiting Professor in Greek at the University of Edinburgh. Dr. Biden, it's an honor to have you with us. The floor is yours. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador, for these very kind words of uh, welcome and uh, introduction. And thank you, Professor Bogdanu, for the um, very generous invitation originally to visit you in uh, Loyola Marymount uh, <coughs> University. And um, now to visit you vicariously in the way that I'm doing from my study in my home in the evening on the uh, north coast of Kent in the southern United Kingdom. Um, I do hope to make it uh, to your, uh, your campus and indeed your part of the world um, one of these days, but sadly this was not to be the occasion. Now if you will bear with me for a brief moment while I share my screen so you can see my presentation. I hope that's now showing. Um, you can see there the title of the, <clears throat> of the talk. And as the ambassador said, um, I am indeed uh, taking the opportunity and thank you for um, taking the time to listen to this, um, to reflect on some aspects of the Greek revolution or war of independence that began almost exactly um, 200 years ago um, from next week. And <clears throat> specifically in this talk, really, to suggest some ways in which we can place that uh, event in a worldwide and Europe-wide context. So I'd like to start by running through <clears throat> some, I think, pretty well-known historical facts, taking a long view. Those things that I'm sure <clears throat> you're all very familiar with. In July 1776, you don't need a Brit to tell you that the American Declaration of Independence set out the self-evident truth that all men are created equal and enjoy an inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It all really, in many ways, started right back then. In 1789, again in the month of July, the storming of the Bastille fortress in Paris, in France, sparked off the train of events that we know as the French Revolution, under the slogan in French, Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité, Liberty, Equality, Fraternity. The turn of the 19th century is often known as the Age of Revolutions. There was the Industrial Revolution, which makes a third after the American and the French, and sometimes the romantic movement in the arts is also um, cited as yet another revolution of that age of revolutions. Between 1792 and 1815, the French Revolutionary and the Napoleonic Wars turned Europe upside down and involved the New World as well. French possessions in the Caribbean were involved um, the US was uh, briefly invaded, as uh, you will know. Um, the initial impetus of the revolution then tur turned into something else once Napoleon had crowned himself emperor and seeked, sought to dominate Europe under the French Empire. Then, the end of the Napoleonic Wars comes the Congress of Vienna, 1814 and 1815, drawing up a blueprint for the, what became known as the Concert of Europe. According to this, European powers will cooperate to maintain a status quo such that events since 1789 can never again be repeated. That was the idea. 1811 to 1825, give or take, the dates of the succession of revolutions in the Caribbean and South, Southern American continent, uh, when all these states won independence from colonial powers in Europe. Back in Europe in 1848, the so-called year of revolutions, it didn't produce many, <clears throat> many direct changes uh, in the political world, many of, the, of those were unsuccessful, but the year of revolutions really began the fatal undermining of the concert of Europe that had dominated for a couple of generations. And it led indirectly or directly to the series of uh, national movements in many parts of Europe, of which the most famous 
are the unifications of Italy and Germany. Moving on, in the um, uh, 1878 and between then and 1913, you get a whole series of new nation states recognized in Southeast Europe in what we now call the Balkans. Um, Russia already abolished, the Russian Empire was already abolished by the <clears throat> Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. So new nation states are emerging all over Europe. After the Second World War, <clears throat> a period of decolonization all over the world <clears throat> sets up a whole lot more new states on the same national model as overseas empires of Britain and France and others disappear. And then there's just room at the bottom of the map to remind you of the 1990s and the rather more localized disintegration of the former Yugoslavia after the end of the Cold War showed the same process still viscerally strong and created um, uh, more than half a dozen new nation states at the very turn of the, at the turn of the 21st century. And finally, just to bring the story up to date, if you think about the current state of Europe, there are nationalist separatist movements in many European countries gaining strength, while tensions rise between nationalist and populist movements on the one hand, and the supranational institutions of the European Union. Is that perhaps today's answer to the concert of Europe of the previous century on the other? So the story of the rise of nation states and the creation of new nation states is by no means over. Well, that's the broad brush story, and I'm sure it's very familiar to you. I've left out, of course, deliberately, the bit that you've all tuned in here to hear about. What about 1821? What about Greece and the Greek Revolution? Well, that's rather my point. Because the broad brush story, at least the way it's always been told in English, either leaves out the Greek Revolution altogether, or doesn't quite know where to put it, how to fit it in. Two influential <coughs> studies of the growth of modern nationalism published in the 1990s, one by Eric Hobsbawm, the other by John Bruley, explicitly doubted whether the Greek Revolution was even a national liberal revolution at all. And other generalist historians, or broad, historians of Europe or of nationalism, sidestepped the Greek issue of Greece rather awkwardly or treated as a special case. A survey of revolutionary Europe, this one, um, the third one on the screen, published last year, notes only that, I quote, um, in Greece, national, nationalism and liberalism came together to produce its own revolutionary movement. But it doesn't really, the book doesn't really consider how this came about or how events in Greece might have been integrally related with all the other ones that I've been talking about just now. On the Greek side, Greek historians have a different take again. But this one too has the perhaps unintended effect of seeming to isolate the revolution in Greece from events and motivations that were current in many different parts of the world at the same time. Greece was different, the Greek historical account goes. And this is because, as became very firmly established in the 19th century, the dominant Greek historical nar narrative states that Greece had become a nation already in ancient times. This is the, <clears throat> the argument of um, the great his historian of modern, of, of of Greece, of the Greek people, Konstantinos Paparigopoulos, whom you see on the screen. And according to that version of history, according to that understanding of history, the struggles of the 1820s had been about restoring that ancient nation to its former rightful condition. At the time and since, Greek independence was regularly referred to as the revival regeneration, sometimes even the resurrection of ancient Greece. Exceptionalism, the argument that you know, one's own country is different for X or Y reason, 
isn't unique to Greece. Far from it. That's the thing about exceptionalism. Actually, everybody does it. Every nation in its own national narrative um, likes to present itself as exceptional. Um, and I'm sure we can all think of e examples uh, close to our home or perhaps second home. But when you put these two perspectives together, the broad brush European and the traditional Greek, you find that extraordinarily between them, they've managed to eclipse what I think is the true significance of 1821 in its broader contemporary international context. First of all, in the context of the long durée, the long duration of Greek history, the creation of the nation state out of the revolution of the 1820s wasn't a restoration at all. It wasn't a revival of something ancient. The Greek nation state, um, and I hope I'm not disillusioning anyone here, but seriously, the Greek nation state that we all know and love today and was created out of that revolution is like nothing that existed in either the ancient or the medieval world. The ancient Greeks, with their passionate fixation on what they called autonomy, they invented that word as so many others current in English today, and the autonomy, they insist on the autonomy of self-governing, mostly small city-states. They never managed to make that leap to create a, a broader state or a, 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 anything like a nation-state. The Byzantine state, huge, wealthy, powerful, for much of the Middle Ages was something else again, and it never chose to define itself as Hellas or Elada, or its people as Hellenes, as Greeks have done since 1821. <clears throat> so the nation state that became a reality during the 1820s and the 1830s was every bit as much of a novelty for Greeks at the time, even if you accept <clears throat> the argument of Greek exceptionalism, as it was for the rest of the European continent at the time. <coughs> and when you look at it against the broad sweep of modern history that I started with, that novelty of the creation of the new Greek nation state is all the more striking. And it reaches far beyond the rather narrow boundaries of that independent Greek state as it was first constituted. The key date and the key event, I will argue, is one that is often overlooked or downplayed, even sometimes in histories of the revolution itself. The decisive moment came on the 3rd of February in the year 1830. And it happened not on the battlefield or even in Greece at all, but in a dry conclave of dignitaries held at the British Foreign Office on Whitehall in London. On that day, a document was signed by British Foreign Secretary Lord Aberdeen and the ambassadors of France and Russia, their names are all at the bottom of the screen. Um, and it declared, and this is the first time in an official document that something like this was said. It declared, I translate the bit in larger type in the middle, French, of course, was the international language at the time. It says, Greece will form an independent state and will enjoy all those rights, political, administrative, and commercial, attached to complete independence. Greece, or in Greek, Elas at the time, Elada today, was born at that moment and took its place from that moment on the political map of Europe. The revolution, of course, wasn't yet over in 1830, it would take another two years for all the details of independence to be worked out, including frontiers and the, and the system of government. I'll come back to that at the very end. But that date in February marks the turning point. Now, what this means is that the Greek Revolution of the 1820s was the first liberal national movement to succeed in the old world of Europe and to result in the creation of a new state, which is also a new type of state in the world at that time, which today we call a nation state. Greece came after the United States, after the French Revolution, which after all was not, French viewers, please forgive me, 
entire success at the time, and, and in tandem, overlapping with the similar movements in South America. But Greece was recognized as sovereign and independent in 1830, before all the more familiar national unifications, national independencies of the European continent. The ideological groundwork had been laid mostly by thinkers writing in French and German during the century before. I'm not arguing that the Greeks invented the idea of a nation state, they didn't. But it was in Greece that the experiment was first put into practice and the Greeks were the first people who seized upon the idea and put it into practice. The dates on the slide with the national flags alongside, and they're by far from being a full list, by the way, I think say it all. The outcome of the Greek Revolution was the pivotal point on which the whole geopolitical map of Europe tilted from the 18th century model of multi-ethnic, autocratically ruled empires to the 20th century, now 21st century model of the self-determination of nation states. Now, how did all that come about? What was it about events in Greece and about the dynamics or the ideologies involved in the conflict that made that outcome possible, let alone a facts of history as they became? The short answer, as I believe, is that right from the beginning of the Greek uprising, right from the beginning, it was more than a local affair. Broader interests and broader perspectives were involved, as well as the real grievances. And once the killing had begun, because it was a violent, unpleasant in many ways affair, the urgent need of people on the ground to save their lives and what they could of their livelihoods. From that point of view, it's instructive to compare the Greek revolt with events in Serbia in 1804 and again in 1815. The Serbs actually rebelled against the Ottomans before the Greeks did. And these, these uprisings have often, in hindsight, been claimed as part of a national struggle too. And their consequences indeed would eventually morph into one. But even when a degree of autonomy was granted to Serbia in 1817 <clears throat> and further consolidated in 1829, that conflict had little resonance outside the borders of the Ottoman Empire. The Serbs did win a significant degree of autonomy for themselves, but they didn't change the external frontiers of the Ottoman Empire at all, nor fundamentally the empire itself or the principles on which it was run. Serbia, although autonomous within the Ottoman Empire, didn't gain full independence until 1878, a full half century after Greece. I suggest the reason for that is that the Serbs fought alone, as indeed most national uprisings do, but the Greeks didn't, did not. So let's take a look now at what I call the international dimension of the Greek revolution. And in doing that, I don't for a moment mean to um, minimize or to play down the bravery, the tactical brilliance or the sheer determination of the Greeks who fought in the front line. Their stories have been told many times and their deeds commemorated. And doubtless they will continue to be told again during the, uh, this 200th anniversary year. But, but for their actions and their persistence, there could never have been an international dimension in the first place. But left to themselves, I'm speculating now, would a Theodoros Kolokotronis or an Odysseus Androutsos have ended up as another Karajori Servias, Kara George of Serbia, or Milos Obrenovic, perhaps lording it over the Peloponnese and Rumeli, respectively, while still nominally subject to the Ottoman Sultan, as the island of Samos, for example, um, continued to do until 1912. The difference, I suggest, lies precisely in this international dimension. <coughs> a 
it began, and here I'm probably now moving on to more familiar ground. It began on the 6th of March, 1821, or according to the Orthodox, the Greek calendar at the time, the 22nd of February. A one-armed senior officer in the Russian Imperial Service slipped across the river Prut. You can see the outline of the river in bold on the screen. My pointer is highlighting it there. Um, with a handful of retainers, he didn't have an army, from Russian territory into Ottoman-controlled Moldavia. He moves that way from Russia here into the Ottoman-controlled Balkans here. <clears throat> he's only got one arm, so he's not in active service. You can tactfully, his arm has been um, <clears throat> is sewn in, it's been sewn into his uniform uh, here. Um, but it doesn't stop him becoming the leader of a revolution. Like many high-minded, like high-ranking Russians in those days, um, <clears throat> his native language was Greek, and his name was Alexandros Ypsilandis. He was the leader of the conspiracy. Uh, very well known in Greece, uh, known as the Filiki Eteria, or Friendly Society. The society had been secretly recruiting members for a number of years among the Greeks of the Ottoman Empire and exiled Greeks in Europe. Two days later, on the 24th of February or 8th of March, in the Moldavian capital Yash, Ypsilandis issued a proclamation with the title Mahu Iperpistios Kepatridos, fight for faith and fatherland. <clears throat> In English it begins, the hour has come, O men of Hellas, the enlightened peoples of Europe, full of gratitude for the benefits bequeathed by our ancestors to themselves, eagerly await the liberty of Hellenes. Note that immediate reference to the enlightened peoples of Europe, and indeed their debt to the ancient Greeks. And a month after that, in Kalamata, in <clears throat> the manifesto, <coughs> according to the English text, addressed to Europe by Pe Pe Petros Mavromichalis, commander-in-chief of the Spartan troops and the Messenian Senate, announced that the unhappy Greeks of Peloponnesus had taken up arms against the insupportable yoke of Ottoman ty tyranny. I read just a section of that. We invoke, therefore, the aid of all the civilized nations of Europe that we may the more promptly attain the goal of a just and sacred enterprise, reconquer our rights and regenerate our unfortunate people. Greece, our mother, was the lamp that illuminated you, the Europeans. On this ground, she reckons on your active philanthropy. Both of these texts are direct appeals to what Petrombe calls the philanthropy of the rest of Europe. During March and April 1821, all of the Danubian principalities, most of what is now mainland Greece from Thessaloniki, Thessaloniki in the north um, down to the southern Peloponnese, many towns and islands across the Aegean, all rose up in response to these calls. Nothing on a scale had ever happened against Ottoman rule in all the hundreds of years that it had existed. Despite this the enormous support for the uh, revolutionary call. During the first months, fearsome reprisals by the Ottomans came actually came quite close to stamping out the revolt altogether. In Moldavia and Wallachia, despite initial successes, the thousands of Greeks and also other Balkan volunteers who had rallied behind Ypsilandis were routed by an Ottoman army in June 1821. Ypsilantis himself rather ignominiously sought refuge in Aust Austrian territory, where he was interned for the rest of his short life. Many of his supporters fought to the death or were captured or executed. Further south in Macedonia, in Thessaly, on the seaboard of Anatolia, the revolt was ruthlessly put down. Despite ambitious plans that had been laid by the friendly society, the Filiki Eteria, there was no outbreak in the capital, Constantinople. But not even that was enough to save the Fanariot, Greek-speaking Orthodox aristocracy, from near annihilation in a vicious series of Ottoman reprisals. It was only in one relatively small part of the Greek-speaking world that the revolution really took hold. 
but there it took hold and it took off in a big way. This was the Peloponnese. The often told story that's depicted in this famous painting, that the standard of revolt was raised by the Bishop, uh, Bishop Yermanos of Old Patras at the monastery of Ayia Lavra, about the town of Calavita, on the day of the Christian festival of the Annunciation, um, 25th March, is almost certainly apocryphal. It's one of those stories that's kind of too good to be true. <clears throat> but once violence had broken out all over the peninsula in early April or late March, according to the Canada in use at the time, there was certainly no going back. Local leaders backed by former brigands and irregular bands of their armed followers <clears throat> seized the initiative and swept across the country. Those Muslims who survived the first onslaught and took refuge with the Ottoman garrisons that remained in the larger towns and a series of strongholds that had been built in the time of Venetian and Ottoman, uh, of Crusader and Venetian rulers many hundreds of years before. From the Peloponnese, the action spread to some of the nearby islands, notably Idra and Spetsis, just off the northeast coast, and Psara on the opposite side of the Aegean. Among them, these three small islands boasted the lion's share of Greek-owned shipping in the entire eastern Mediterranean. Armed merchantmen based on these islands began to achieve marked successes against the Ottoman navy. Other larger islands joined in, um, notably Samos and Crete, though many others actually didn't. At the end of the year, a first national assembly brought together representatives from all the areas that had been liberated to draw up a constitution for free Greece. The site chosen for the assembly was a village called Piazza in the northeastern Peloponnese. Close by lay the remains of the ancient theatre and the sanctuary of the god of the ancient god of healing Asclepius at Epidavros, Epidorus. And the first provisional constitution that emerged has ever since been known as the Epidorus or Epidavros constitution. This document drew very much on the, on the constitution of the United States of America and on successive Republican constitutions that briefly came into force in France during the period of their revolution. And from the American Revolution, it particularly drew on and based the its provisional government on the principle of the strict separation of powers between the legislature and the executive. Most of these political aspirations would turn out to be casualties, at least in the short term, of the actual process of gaining independence. But one resolution that was made, one decision that was made in the deliberations at the very end of 1821, ratified on the first day of 1822, uh, did for all time establish that the newly liberated realm was to be known by the ancient name of Hellas, Hellas, and its citizens as Hellenes. That's the part of the text that I've highlighted on the screen. Osi autochthonas catechitis epigrapias in Hellenes, que pistevus in iston Christon, isa is in Hellenes, and so on, are Greeks. And so effective has that collective act of reinvention been that it <clears throat> takes an effort of imagination today to realize just how innovative it was at the time. Many Greeks would still continue to think of themselves as Romyi, which literally means Romans, of course, in everyday contexts and informally among themselves for at least a century and a half after that. But the official designations, what's written in every Greek's passport and official documents from 1822 right up to today um, is always Elas or Elada, the country, and Elinas, Elinas in plural, the people. Um, the, that is the political reality that was shaped at the end of 1821, enshrined in that constitution, and it's never been questioned since. So that's absolutely set almost in stone in that first constitutional act in 1821. But back in the, at the time, it was one thing to talk of national assemblies, political rights, and the separation of powers. 
But the realities of liberation on the ground looked rather different to most of the rank and file of those whose actions had achieved it. The majority of those who took up arms did so in the name of their Orthodox Christian faith. And this is a rather delightful flag of the island of Ithra. The, um, you see the, the name spelt, uh, in, split in two across the anchor, but uh, the, the anchor obviously representing the maritime community of uh, the ship owners and ship um, uh, builders of Ithra <clears throat> with the Christian symbol of the cross. And the slogan of the revolution that was everywhere, Eletheria Ithanatos, liberty or death. There was no middle way. But these right in the center and above all is the Christian cross. For most of those who took up arms, what mattered, they were fighting for their Orthodox Christian faith. The enemy are usually called in Greek Turks, Turki. But Turki at that time, they don't really mean ethnic Turks in the sense that the word means today. It simply means, uh, it means Muslims, um, as in the Greek verb, you know, uh, you say someone, Turkepse, you know, turned Turk, you mean became a Muslim. In fact, most of the Muslims in the, the area of the Peloponnese wouldn't at that time have been uh, ethnic Turks at all. Um, most of them would have been, uh, been Arvanites, Albanian, Albanian speakers. At grassroots level, it's a war of religion. <clears throat> and the new talk of Elines and Elas, and the heroes of Marathon and Thermopylae and the great battles of antiquity, all this had yet to filter through to villagers or even chieftains who had never learned to read. When it did, it would remain only a thin veneer for some time. But liberty, once it began to be achieved, meant rather different things to the architects of that first constitution on the one hand, and to the warlords who now vied with one another and with the official provisional government to impose their will upon the local areas that they had liberated. During a relative lull in the external front, on the external front, <coughs> excuse me, on 1820, in 1823 and 1824, the Greek revolution faced its first political test. This was a conflict not just between individuals, but between whole concepts of what liberty was going to mean for the Greeks ever after. On the one side was Alexandros Mavrokordatos, the politician, the fanariot. This was the man who had chaired that first national assembly and was elected for the first year president of the executive, that is in effect, president of independent Greece. One of the few men in revolutionary Greece to wear a European frock coat, as you see in the drawing there. Mavroko, that is an unheroic figure, standing not much more than five feet tall, um, stout, wearing thick lens spectacles for his myopia, though he did take them off for the sketch there. Um, but Mavroko, that was a consummate politician. He was a master of eight languages, committed to the humanitarian and secular ideas of the European Enlightenment, and deeply versed in the political theory and geopolitics of the day. He was the one who, he was primarily really the architect of that first constitution. But by 1823, Mavrokodatos was no longer president of the, exec, of the executive. He had become president of the legislature and the most powerful man in the Peloponnese at, by 1823 was the vice president of the executive, Theodoros Kolokotronis, known familiarly as the old man of the Moria or Peloponnese. He, Kolokotronis is a former brigand and soldier. Excuse me. Who had, who had fought under successive foreign governments in the Ionian Islands. He was, uh, he's called the old man, he was 50, he was actually 50 at the time the revolution began. Now, Kolokotronis was a formidable guerrilla chieftain. By the second year of the revolution, he had a string of victories to his name, among them the annihilation of the Ottoman army that had tried and failed to relieve the besieged Ottoman garrison in Daphlio, and had then been trapped and uh, massacred by 
Kolokotroni's men in the narrow pass of Vervenachia near Corinth in June 1822. The Scottish historian George Finlay, an eyewitness to many of these events and the author of one of the most definitive early histories of the Greek Revolution, um, who was very critical of all the characters involved, gave this pen portrait that you can read on the, uh, on the screen. As you can see, it's uh, not a very flattering, uh, not a very flattering portrait. Um, the German volunteer Karl Kratzeisen, I think, gets the, <clears throat> the lineaments of the face and something of the character of the man, uh, whether or not you agree that it chimes with Finley's description, I think particularly finely in that line drawing. Um, strangely, that line drawing has rarely been published the lithograph that was based on it and published and is very well known, and there's a famous oil painting based on that, they're actually much less detailed and have much less of the character of this extraordinary man, Theodorus Kolokotronis. Well, conflict between two such different individuals as Mavrokordatos and Kolokotronis was surely inevitable. And of course, it was a conflict not just between individuals, but between whole concepts of what liberty was going to mean for the Greeks ever after. And on the 24th of July, 1823, in Tripolitza, today's Tripoli in the center of, Pelop of the Peloponnese, the vice president of the executive, that's Kolokotronis, summoned the president of the legislature, that is now Mavrokordatos, and told him that unless he resigned his office at once, he would mount him backwards on a donkey and have him chased out of the Peloponnese with whips. So much for the US doctrine of the separation of powers. Mind you, some recent events in America make you wonder even there. Armed conflict between an alliance of warlords led by Kolokotronis and the provisional government broke out on two separate occasions during 1824. On both those occasions, government forces came out on top. And this had de decisive consequences for the future shape of the, well, indeed, for the outcome, the way in which the revolution finally succeeded and the future shape of the Greek state that resulted from that success. But both the conflict itself and the, the divergent characters of the protagonists have left a profound legacy that I believe is still with us in Greece today. And at the time, and ever since, the old man of the Moria, Kolokotronis, on the right, uh, that's his statue outside the old parliament building in Athens. Um, he, Kolokotronis cuts a charismatic figure with the public imagination, while the political architects of the state, such as Mavrokordatos on the left, depicted in later life, um, <clears throat> um, have languished out of sight. And according to an opinion poll carried out in Greece in December 2019, 19. To 92.7 percent of responses named Kolokotronis as the most important leader of the revolution, with a lead of almost 30 percent over his nearest rival, while Mavrokordatos polled a mere 3 percent. So these are the perceptions today. Part of what was at stake was the very issue of whether to internationalize our struggle with continuing appeals to foreigners for military, financial and diplomatic support, or to try to go it alone. And victory went to those that today we call, historians call modernizers or constitutionalists, that is people like Mavrokordatos, and against the warlords, the capitaneus, such as Kolokotronis, who resented the check to their own individual authority that the involvement of foreigners was likely to bring, and indeed, did. From the end of 1824 onwards, the Greek leadership was firmly focused on widening the conflict beyond Greece and bringing the great powers of Europe into the conflict. But the internal split that came to the surface back then has never entirely gone away since and has resurfaced, re-emerged as a fault line in many different later crises in Greek history. By this time, we're talking about the end of 1824 now, 
events in Greece were beginning to make an impact abroad. Those first appeals to Europe had fallen on predictably deaf ears. But if governments still shunned the Greek insurgents, the same could not be said for individuals and pressure groups in many countries. Volunteers came from every corner of the European continent and in significant countries, the very much greater distance and how much greater it must have seemed in those days um, from the United States. And even more influential than those, again, rather charismatic figures whose pictures you see, even more influential in the long run were those Philhellenes as they were called, who stayed at home to organize campaigns in their own countries, to lobby governments and to raise funds in aid of the Greek cause. It was very much as a result of these activities that governments abroad slowly and usually reluctantly began to reassess their positions towards Greece. The British Foreign Secretary, George Canning, early in 1923, recognized that captains and crews of Greek ships in, on the high seas as legitimate belligerents rather than as pirates, and therefore acknowledged also the right of the Greek ships to enforce a blockade of Ottoman ports. At the end of the same year, 1823, in the US, uh, President James Monroe came very close to recognizing the independence of Greece in a famous speech to Congress. The speech is mainly remembered today for setting out what's still called the Monroe Doctrine. According, this sets out the <clears throat> respective spheres of influence for Europe and the new world in the 19th century. But the presidential address of 2nd December, 1823, also included the words, there is good cause to believe that Greece will become again an independent nation that she may obtain that rank is the object of our most ardent wishes. So spoke the President of the United States. A little over a year later, a bill was introduced to Congress that would have explicitly recognized Greek independence if it had passed. It didn't pass, but even so, public support in America <clears throat> remained strong enough to allow for the building of the uh, fighting frigate Hellas uh, in a New York shipyard and for the ship to be duly delivered to the Greek government at the end of 1826. By that time, the end of 1826, the attitudes of governments in Europe had begun to change. From the spring of that year, 1826, the three great powers that had interests in the Eastern Mediterranean, Great Britain, France and Russia, embarked a delicate series of negotiations, not with the Greeks or with each other, but uh, I'm sorry, not with the Greeks or the Ottomans, but with each other. If Ottoman power was going to be seriously weakened in Europe, it mattered a great deal to each of the three great powers that no one of the others should gain a geopolitical advantage from doing so. This was a diplomatic dilemma that would shortly become <clears throat> notorious as the Eastern question and it wouldn't finally be resolved for a full century until after the First World War. In 1827, these three powers agreed jointly to send a naval task force into the Aegean, charged with enforcing a truce between the belligerents. Not surprisingly, the Greeks were delighted at this apparent um, show of strength as they took it on their side. They welcomed the arrival of the foreigners. The Ottomans, on the other hand, repudiated it as unjustified interference in their own internal affairs. Well, the unintended consequence of that initiative, as everyone knows, <clears throat> was a naval engagement in Navarino Bay off the southwest coast of the Peloponnese on the 20th of October, 1827. The combined Ottoman and, Egypt and Egyptian fleets were all but destroyed. Ottoman troops <clears throat> were soon afterwards forced to leave the Peloponnese. So from that point onwards, the success of the Greek revolution in some form was assured. But the eventual form of the settlement, 
had been taken out of Greek hands. Now it was up to the great powers to find a resolution. And this would take several more years to work out. During that time, while it was being worked out, Greece was ruled by Ioannis Kapodistrias, or known in English as Count John Kapodistria. He was an aristocrat from Corfu who had joined the Russian service and like many Greeks at that time, like such as Ypsilandis, had been able to rise to the very top to become joint foreign minister of Russia under Tsar Alexander I from 1814 to 1822. By the time that Kapodistrias was assassinated in October 1831, the powers had already made up their minds that the new state was not going to be a republic as the first constitution had determined, but rather uh, a uh, but rather a monarchy. Prince Otto, the second son of the Philhellene King Ludwig of Bavaria, uh, was named as the first king of independent Greece. Frontiers for the kingdom were de determined at the same time. I apologize for the rather garish coloring on that map which comes from Wikipedia, but I, I did just lash out with a uh, a felt tip pen to show to ring in red the small amount of territory that was all that was granted independence in under the uh, settlement of 1832. These frontiers include, as you can see on the map, only the southern half of mainland Greece as it is today, and those islands closest to it in the Aegean. Uh, neither the Greeks nor the Ottomans <clears throat> had any say in these decisions. And this was how Greece, alas or Elada, came to take its place among the political states of Europe. The future king, Prince Otto, arrived at Nafplio aboard a British warship on the 6th of February 1833 to a rapturous reception on the shore. The ships of many nations had gathered in the bay and fired off their guns in salute. You can just make out the king on his horse, almost in the centre of the picture there. Um, <clears throat> the event marked a double first. It was the first Greek state in all the long history of the Greeks. And it was the first new nation state to follow the example of the, of the Americas and to precede all the new nation states that we know in Europe today and win recognition as an independent nation state in the old world of Europe. And with that, uh, I leave you. I will be very happy to throw the floor open for uh, questions and I'll do my best to answer any questions that you have. In the uh Thank you for listening. Enrico Tokaristoma, thank you very much. Um, we have we have asked our guests to have their microphones uh, off, uh, but they can type uh, any questions they may have in the chat box. And we do have a couple of questions. So I will start with those. And in the meantime, please feel free to uh, send more questions if you want. Uh, Professor Beaton, we have a question by Nectarea Klapaki. I'm sorry, oh, you're... Thanks to Nectaria, once upon a time. Nectaria, Nectaria is here today, so I was very happy to, to join no, you. No, Unfortunately, to my very much value. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, I cannot turn on her camera, uh, but I will just read her question for you. She's asking, why in your view, historians like uh, Hobsbawm uh, and others have altogether omitted 1821 from their accounts or have difficulty fitting in, into them? Well, I mean, it's kind of like I said, I mean, the, 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 the quite, I mean, you know, if you come to the story from where I or probably most of you are coming, I mean, you know, you can see that the, the, they feel uncomfortable with it. They, they're, they're, they're not at ease with it. I mean, Hobsbawm, um, I don't have his book at home, so I haven't been able to check exactly what he said, but I noted that some years ago, <clears throat> when I first read his book, that you know, he, he, you know, he, he notes dutifully that the revolution did take place in Greece um, and that it was successful, but 
you know, but he sees it as a local affair. It's, you know, it's brigandage. I mean, he also wrote a wonderful book about brigands, actually, in which the Greek clefts um, do play a part. So, you know, it's kind of guerrilla warfare. It was social banditry of his other themes, um, writ large and successful. Um, so, you know, he doesn't actually give it a place in, um, in, in, the, in the, you know, in the national story. John Brody takes the same approach and a number of others um, kind, of, kind of leave it out uh, leave it out altogether. And I just flashed up on the screen that uh, 2020 book that uh, I've just been reading. Um, because, you know, in a way, what the writer of that book is doing for the whole of Europe, what I've been trying to do for, you know, contextualizing the, the Greek revolution. Um, but it's a, it's a sort of opposite, it's a sort of opposite effect. But, you know, um, there's a, there are only, you know, he, and I, I don't want to speak ill of a book whose author isn't here and probably doesn't know that I'm saying this, he doesn't get so can't answer. But, you know, he doesn't. Um, he doesn't have a great deal to say about the Greek Revolution. Um, he just notes that it's happening at a time when lots of other revolutions are happening, and he doesn't pick up at all on the fact that you know actually the Greek when the Greek Revolution succeeds before all the others in the uh, in the old world. So, I mean, I, mean, I think uh, next year to answer your question. I mean, I I, I, um, I think I mean the, the the simplest way of putting it is that. I mean, that it is, it, what can we say? I mean, it is the age old problem of the barrier of the Greek language. And so, you know, it, people who are not specialists in, Greek, in Greece are always rather hesitant of, um, you know, getting involved. Um, and you, can, you, know, you can't blame them in a way, but because um, it is very complicated. Um, but and I think the other reason, I mean, and I did touch on this, I mean, blame is perhaps not the right word to use, but I mean, I think it's it's also the result of the way in which Greek historians have preferred to tell their own national story, which highlights the Greek revolution as a one-off, as the revival of ancient Greek civilization. And from Paparigopoulos onwards, the term is not so much revival as continuity, um, the, the, con the, continue, the continuous story of the Greek nation from ancient times to modern, but by stressing the antiquity of the Greek nation and the uniqueness of that experience, it completely eclipses the, significant, the newness of what the Greeks actually achieved in the 1820s and 1830s. So, I mean, I, I, mean, I would perhaps respectfully say, suggest that perhaps Greek historians have, I mean, they've told a story which makes, which, I mean, it's the, the story that they, they felt they wished to present to their own people in some ways, obscures to outsiders um, an aspect of the achievement of the Greek people, um, which I do actually think is very important. I mean, again, I don't want to, don't take me wrong on this, but in some ways I often think, you know, we hear too much about ancient Greeks and the achievements of the ancient Greeks. And I do feel that my job is to, is to um, talk about the achievements of the Greeks in modern times and the revolution and the creation of a nation state, a successful new nation state after that is a resoundingly Greek achievement, but it is also a resoundingly modern achievement. It's something that the ancient, you know, Iachei Progoni never managed. The modern Greeks did. So please let's give them the credit for it. And um, it's evening here, so may I, uh, may I raise a glass, Nectaria, and to, you, to those of you watching. Thank you, thank you. Um, we have one more question for uh, Nasreen Babukan. She's thanking you for your talk, including the global perspective. And she's asking that, speaking of exceptionalism, uh, those who hail from the island of Spetses uh, look to Lascarina Bubulina Pinotti as our heroine of the Greek War of Independence. Uh, can you say a few words about her, about Bubulina? Well, sadly, I missed a presentation which many of you may have seen by Mr. Bubulis, who now runs the museum in Spetses. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm very much hoping I'll be able to visit that museum, of which I hear great things um, <clears throat> once the pandemic is over. Um, so um, I also hope to take the opportunity to learn more about the achievements and the you know, remarkable personality of Lascarina Bubulina. But I mean, she certainly was a household name during the revolution and after. Um, I mean, the Greek revolution in many ways, it was on the ground, it was very much a series of local revolutions. And the people of Spetses 
you know, it's a tiny island community and they lived, um, you know, they, they lived by the sea, they built ships, they, um, they, they fished, they traded, they, they, were, they were traders, they were, you know, remarkably wealthy, many of them, um, for the size of their island. Um, and I believe they didn't get on at all well with their um, neighbours across the water in Spets, in, in, in Ithra, either. Uh, there was a moment, I think 1826, when the islanders of Spetses um, had to be evacuated to the safety of Ithra because the, there was a risk that the Ottoman navy would descend. And um, the, I think Bubulina, Bubulina had been killed by that time, tragically. But, um, you know, the, the island of, of Spetses actually you know, hated having to be uh, um, uh, looked after by the, uh, the fellow, uh, fellow islanders who lived exactly the same way of life. And like them, many of them too were Albanian speakers, actually, um, as their first language. Um, you know, there were all these little lo local rivalries, local pride, um, which uh, much of which survives to this... Uh, to this day, but I mean the example of uh, of uh, Lascarina Bubulina and uh, Mirto Mavroyenus. I mean these are examples of people who um, you know of, of women who took an active part, and, um, and I think you know it's important in this anniversary year that uh, we think about the often unsung roles of you know half the population who are women, um, who took part in the revolution, who took great risks, who. Um, made great sacrifices and often I fear, I mean, we must not forget this either, suffered, suffered terribly um, as a result of, the, um, of these actions. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, a question by Alexander Holman. Uh, he's asking, he has a small question um, about uh, the text of the first constitution. He's asking, uh, this is written in classical Greek, not even Katharevusa. Is this with an eye to the Europeans as well as a claim to the Greek past? No, it's not classical Greek. It's not exactly Katharevusa, but it is more. It is the it is the more the semi-official written language that was used by the hierarchy of the Orthodox Church at the at this time. Um, I mean, let's not forget. You know, we often think of the Greek revolutionaries as being unlettered. You know, un, uh, um, I mean, sort of um, peasants and fishermen and people without an education. But there was also a highly educated elite in in uh, in the uh, Greek-speaking elite in the Ottoman Empire. They mostly owed their education um, to the Orthodox Church, to church schools, and also to the <clears throat> the possibility of studying at foreign universities, which many Greek um, subjects of the Ottoman Empire actually did. So. Um, the there was a there was a you know centuries old uh, bureaucratic tradition around the um, ecumenical patriarchate and the administration of the uh, principalities of Wallachia and Moldavia, um, which functioned in a, a form a formal version of modern Greek, but it is a, it is more it is not ancient Greek. It's a and it's not. I mean, Katharevusa is kin to it. Katharevusa was, a, was a, a later invention in the nineteenth, uh, in the nineteenth century. But I would describe it as the, uh, as the kind of semi-official formal language of the um, Orthodox hierarchy at the, uh, at the time. Okay, thank you. One last question, because I know it is very late for you, so we don't want to keep you. Um, I've got my glass. You got it. Fine. Uh, Ella Simons, uh, she's thanking you very much for your talk and for being a wonderful Phil Helene. And she's asking, where can we find uh, source documents of the time and personal letters from the protagonists? Uh, in English, nowhere. Um, there's an enormous archive, body of archives that have not been published, but there's also a pretty overwhelming, overwhelming body of Printed material. Many of the many of the archives of the revolution were published about the middle of the, in the early or middle of the twentieth century, and the archive of Mavrokordatos alone for the years eighteen twenty two to eighteen twenty eight consists of six, five or no six six folio sized volumes of an average of four hundred pages. Now that's his own correspondence, both letters written to him about him and by him but you know and and this man lived for another, for another 40 years 
and all that correspondence hasn't been published at all. And there's, there are other archives are online. The Coletti's archive, I think, is online. There's a great, there's a huge amount of material left by Capodistrias. And I think one of the, oh, and other, the communities of Idra and Spetses also kept written archives. And these were published in the early 20th century. They're quite hard. You've got to go to somewhere like the uh, Gennadius Library of the American School of Classical uh, <clears throat> Studies in Athens to find them, but they do exist. So even without having to go into literal archives and wrestle with the, I find extremely difficult Greek handwriting of that period, there are, there are letters and there are do official documents uh, that are in the public domain. And they're absolutely fascinating, but they also highlight an aspect of the revolution I just touched on in answer to one of the previous questions that, you know, that there are a, an awful lot of people are not only literate, but, you know, the sort of verbal diarrhea sort of um, pouring itself all over paper all over and um, the conduct of the revolution. You sometimes think, how did these people have time to fight? They're writing so many letters. But it's an aspect that I think certainly the, the perspective we have following, you know, from the English language histories um, of the revolution, I think it's, it's, a rather, it's a rather neglected one. One last person and then we'll, we'll let you go and enjoy your wine. Um, we have a question by George Altas. Uh, he's asking, the remark in the Epidorian constitution defining Greek nationality as congruent with Christianity is distinct from enlightenment political theory separating church from state. Would you address how this affected the development of the modern Greek nation state? Aha, that's a that's a really neat question because it 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 pinpoints exactly the the aspect in which that early constitution diverged from all these Enlightenment predecessors, because all the other movements are more or to varying degrees, either in France, it's strongly anti-clerical, in America, it's not anti-clerical, quite, there's quite a strong Christian element, I think, even in the Declaration and the Constitution, but the separation of church and state, um, I think, um, you'll know better than I do, I think you know, it is fundamental in, in the United States as well. In Greece, on the other hand, um, you know, the other side of this coin is that the people who write in this constitution are they grown up as Ottoman subjects. They think in terms of the bureaucratic mechanisms of the Ottoman state, and that defines citizens by their religious faith, not what they believe as individuals. You know, faith is a kind of it's a political matter in the Ottoman Empire. So Orthodox Christians, it's a you know it's a label that defines a community. And so it's, you know, what would later become called known as Romulusini, the condition of being Romyi, meaning the Rum Milet, the Orthodox Christian subjects of the Ottoman Empire. This is the, the kind of inevitable way to define uh, the citizens of the new state in the conditions of the time. But you're absolutely right. It's a real break with the Enlightenment um, example. And it, of course, runs right through the subsequent history of the Greek state to the present day, the whole debate about whether being Greek is the same as being Greek Orthodox. And of course, as we all know, it's never been true that all Greek subjects are of the Orthodox faith. There are Catholic communities, there are all many of Jews communities, Jewish communities, um, <clears throat> and um, at various times there have been Muslim communities, as indeed there are again today. So that that's one, it was a hot topic in the 1820s. And you might, the way to, one way to see it is that actually the architects of that constitution dodged that hot topic. And as a, as a result, their successors today are still stuck with it. The relation between church and state in Greece um, is still an unresolved issue, I would suggest. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Uh, thanks to everyone who uh, joined us today. Many thanks to uh, the ambassador, the consul general. Uh, and I hope that um, we will all, you know, uh, meet soon uh, in real life and uh, for another presentation. So thank you very much all for coming. Thank well, you. thank you very much. And thank you for listening. And thank you for your questions. Thank you, Professor. It was fascinating. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. And thank you, Ambassador. Have a good evening. Thank you.